It's a well-established tradition for the Faculty Senate to host uh, the State of the University Address. So I'm Mike Sloan, current chair of the Faculty Senate. It's my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Ray Watts, our seventh UAB president. As some of you may well know, uh, Dr. Watts is a native of Birmingham, a product of West End High School and our own School of uh, Engineering. Uh, he then went on to study medicine at Washington University of St. Louis, followed by residencies and fellowships at Harvard Medical School, Mass General, and the NIH. After being on the faculty at Emory University, he returned to uh, his native Birmingham as chair of neurology here at UAB in 2003. In 2010, he was appointed senior vice president and dean of school of medicine. And in 2013, he was appointed our seventh UAB president. Now, under his leadership, UAB has seen unprecedented growth in all areas of our mission, increased undergraduate and graduate enrollment, increased research funding, increased healthcare, increased uh, buildings and our physical footprint. We've had a major uh, $1 billion capital campaign and uh, importantly, we've also been increased our community engagement with his native Birmingham. Now, we live uh, this year in unprecedented times and there was no manual that we could pull off the shelf to uh, indicate how a major top flight uh, universe, research university and medical center should deal with a pandemic such as we're faced with today. There were no best practices from any peer group of peer or aspirational institutions to guide us. And so under Dr. Watts's leadership, uh, UAB turned inward and we drew on the expertise and talents of senior leaders, faculty and staff throughout the campus uh, to develop procedures and protocols to cope uh, with the pandemic so that we could return to our core missions of education patient care and research. Now the planning and implementation of all these procedures has been a massive undertaking starting way back February uh, or so. And uh, importantly, leaders from undergrad and graduate students, staff council, and also leadership on the faculty senate have been involved in uh, making these decisions and implementing these, these procedures. Uh, needless to say, all constituent groups of our UAB community has had to make sacrifices, and I think it's to uh, great credit to Dr. Watts's leadership that despite the severe financial um, uh, considerations that we face, that the impact of, of COVID on our students, staff, and faculty has, has been minimized. Um, Obviously, every group has, has made sacrifices, but given the response of the UAB community, I, I think we're off to, we're well into a, a successful fall semester. Uh, as chair of the Faculty Senate, uh, I join the leadership calls uh, several times a week, and uh, it's evident that Dr. Watts and senior leaders at UAB are making evidence-based decisions and hold the health and safety of students, faculty, and staff uh, as their number one priority. And we must remain uh, vigilant in this. Um, so it's my pleasure now to welcome uh, Dr. Ray Watts for the 2020 State of the University Address. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Sloan. Uh, you summarized well some of the challenges that we faced in an unprecedented time of a pandemic like the world has never seen for 100 years. But I can say that I can't be prouder than I have been of the entire UAB community. Our community has risen to the, every challenge, worked unselfishly, and many times 24 seven dedicated themselves to the greater good <clears throat> to help us fight this virus and help us keep the UAB community. But beyond that, the Birmingham and metropolitan area in the state and indeed the work that our researchers and doctors and healthcare providers and others have undertaken 
are helping people across the country and around the world. First slide, please. Our doctors, nurses, healthcare providers of all backgrounds have been real leaders on the front line of patient care. And they have sacrificed themselves in many ways to care for an unprecedented number of patients with COVID that in March and April almost shut our hospital down except for dealing with this new pandemic. But they have all worked hard and risen to the occasion our infectious disease and pulmonary critical care faculty and nurses worked right on the front line caring for the sickest of patients. Our physicians and nurses across the hospital, leaders across the hospital and the health system, Drs. Vicker and Fernani, Reed Jones, and everyone on their teams worked tirelessly. Our experts from the School of Public Health and School of Health Professions from information technology, informatics, microbiology, basic research across the board gathered together to undertake the challenges faced by COVID. Our leadership, faculty, staff, students, and community supporters have worked to help us attack this through research. Through the efforts of Tom Brannon and our development teams, we raised $1.4 million and put that directly to pilot research grants attacking COVID from all angles. We funded 24 six month high impact grants that have produced results that are leading to new large grant proposals and are studying the mechanisms of this virus, how to stop it and studying how to develop vaccines. Our investigators in the hospital and in the clinics on the clinical trials front have been at the forefront of testing new treatments and testing new, new vaccines. That's going on right now, today and every day. Our talented faculty and staff work together to build the Health Check app and the Guide Safe Exposure Notification app to help us keep our UAB community as healthy as possible. And we shared that with universities and colleges across the state and with companies that wanted to use this to help keep their employees safe. Next slide, please. Our communications teams under the leadership of Jim Backen and Rosie O'Byrne have been tireless in their work of trying to allow our physicians and scientists to inform our local community, our state, our nation, and the world about the challenges we're facing and taking new data and trying to understand that and explain it. Dr. Jeannie Marazzo, Dr. Mike Sag, and the entire Infectious Disease Division have been tremendous in their ability to explain to the world all of these challenges that we're facing. They have been on every news station around the country and many around the world. Through the 68,000 media hits, our communicators have reached an audience of over 2.5 billion around the world. Next slide, please. As we dealt with the ravages of COVID in those early couple of months, we realized that we had to continue our very important work across our broad mission of education and research, healthcare to others who don't have COVID, our community support, which was needed more than ever, and our economic impact and development. So through the support of many people, our entire leadership team, our faculty and our staff and our students, we have been able to pivot and to be able to pursue these very important mission pillars. We've received unwavering support from Chancellor St. John and the UA system team and our board of trustees. That support has allowed us to be able to adapt quickly 
and to make changes that allow us to pursue our mission across every front. Next slide, please. Remarkably, we experienced a fifth straight year of record enrollment, as well as record retention, the highest we've ever had. Under the leadership of Provost Benoit and Vice Provost Bradley Barnes, our enrollment broke 2,000, 2,200, I'm sorry, 22,500 for the first time. And our credit hour production was up about 2% as well. We continue to have one of the most diverse student bodies in the country. And you can see 42% of our undergraduates are underrepresented minorities. And proudly, we are one of only 14 universities nationally to receive the insight into diversity, diversity champion award. And you can see that we're educating many undergraduates who are first in their family to go to college. And we know that this education will change their lives and will change their families' lives and their communities. Next slide, please. Not only do we have the largest student body ever, we have the most academically prepared freshman class ever with average ACTs of almost 26 and average GPAs of over 3.8. Our Honors College and the leadership of Dean Blanton continues to excel with enrollment reaching almost 2,500 this year and their increased freshman average ACT was over 30 and GPA over 4.1. And our students continue to win prestigious national and international scholarships and fellowships, as you can see on this slide. We had a record number of Fulbright scholars, eight, and a recent alumnus. We have Rhodes finalists, and we have NSF graduate fellowships, and the first Beinecke scholarship for graduate study in the arts, humanities, or social sciences. And you can see the picture of our new Honors Hall, which is a beautiful new renovation. And it's on the corner of 10th Avenue and 14th Street. And it's a beautiful functional building that they're proud to be in now as of this semester. Next slide, please. We continue to offer truly novel and disciplinary programs. This year launched our Bachelor of Science in Cancer Biology and a PhD program in neuroengineering, both the first of such programs in the nation. And importantly, these are collaborations between schools across the campus to bring exceptional opportunities to our 21st century students. We also launched our entrepreneurship major, Bachelor of Science in the Collat School of Business, and they are doing well and have an entering class of over 25 majors the first year. And last year, we graduated two from our innovative programs, undergrad and Bachelor of Science in Immunology, the first program of its type in the Southeast, and our dental doctorate with an MBA dual degree. Next slide, please. We continued development of our signature core curriculum under the leadership of Provost Benoit and co-chairs Allison Chapman and Suzanne Judd. The SEC committee has worked across the campus and they put together plans for this new signature core curriculum as part of the Forging the Future strategic plan. It's been vetted by the Faculty Senate Curriculum Committee and presented to the full Senate Board of Trustees and over the next year or two, they will develop the curricular structure and implement new courses that will be developed to make this one of the exciting parts of our undergraduate experience. Next slide, please. On the leadership of Dean Lori McMahon and our deans across the schools and colleges, our graduate programs continue to excel. Our master's in health administration continues to be number one in the nation, and you see all the other diverse programs that are allowing our students to be in the most advanced programs in the country. Next slide, please. 
We have over the last five years been in our most successful era of research funding in our history. Over the last five years, we've increased our extramural support 43%. And each year over these last five years, we have grown. And remarkably this year, under the leadership of Senior Vice President for Medicine, Selvin Vickers and Vice President for Research, Chris Brown, we anticipate eclipsing $640 million in spite of COVID. And it was interesting while our faculty, many of us worked remotely, our number of grant proposals went up during that time versus last year. So people were working hard to try to undertake new research to make new discoveries, which change the future. Every new treatment for serious medical illnesses and most advances in research and technology are underpinned by research and the discovery of new knowledge. Next slide, please. Our programs remain highly competitive among the nation's top research universities. You can see that among public universities, UAB as a whole and our School of Medicine, School of Dentistry and School of Public Health all rank within the top 10 among public universities and essentially in the top 20 among all universities. And of that, we all have a lot to be proud. Next slide, please. Our Harvard Institute for Innovation Entrepreneurship and our UAB Research Foundation continue to help commercialize discoveries and launch new startups. This year, the HIIE had the sixth straight year with a positive bottom line, again, in spite of COVID. And they continue to be among 20% nationally that are positive in their bottom line among all university technology transfer programs. They generated significant revenue patent, and you see they helped launch five faculty startups this year and two student startups. Our program uh, is supported by the U.S. Economic Development Administration under Dr. Kathy Nugent's leadership, and they invested through us $300,000 in 11 projects around campus to help get through a critical period between research and commercialization and to continue the momentum of research innovation for years to come. Our student startup boot camp, rebranded Anvil, is busy and continues to help educate and lead our students in how to be entrepreneurs and how to launch successful new startups. Next slide, please. UAB has long been at the forefront of a focus on health disparities. And this particular program under the leadership of Dr. Appender Manny is a partnership between our O'Neill Comprehensive Cancer Center and Tuskegee University and Morehouse School of Medicine in Atlanta. This program has been supported for 13 years through the National Cancer Institute. And I think you can see on this slide the tremendous impact it's had, not just on us, but especially on Tuskegee and Morehouse. Their funding and numbers of universe, numbers of researchers, number of manuscripts, and their productivity and activities around cancer research have been truly empowered through this partnership. Other NIH funded research partnership and educational programs with Alabama State University. And you can see that Dr. Manny and his team and others have trained over 65 undergraduates through on hands, hands on research experiences in the summer. So we're proud of this and we continue to have this as a major focus of UAB as we take care of patients throughout Alabama, but even throughout the Southeast. Next slide, please. Our grand challenge, which we developed over the last two years, was in the very beginnings of implementation in year one, when the COVID pandemic hit us. And they quickly pivoted 
toward prevention and wellness in our underserved communities. They expanded testing through the CARES Act across Jefferson County. They helped set up 69 community testings over 37 days at 26 different sites. They went into communities and neighborhoods and the neighbors could walk up and get a COVID test if they didn't have a car to drive to one of our drive up locations. And they have continued to work to help battle COVID in our neighborhoods, in our underserved communities throughout Birmingham and Jefferson County. And we continue that work and they continue to expand and we'll do more. Next slide, please. But they haven't lost focus on the grand challenge that was being launched when COVID hit us. They have continued to work in our four demonstration neighborhoods, Kingston in the east and East Lake in the east, Titusville in the west and Inslee Bush Hills in the west. And of course, our own campus and our own employees are a demonstration zone as well. Through work with our facilities team and our Department of Civil Engineering and Construction Engineering, they put together plans for improving the built environment and the physical space within these neighborhoods. They're involved now in building or repairing sidewalks, bus shelters, crosswalks, and additional street lighting and Wi-Fi hotspots and blighted home removal and cleaning up and improving these neighborhoods to make them attractive and make them available for increased physical activity and exercise and for making safe pathways for their students from their homes to their school, in this case, the Hayes K through eight school. But they're working also in Titusville doing the same kinds of enhancements. And importantly, this has been enabled by a great partnership through UAB working with the city of Birmingham, with Alabama Power, with Brasfield and Gorey, Dunn Construction, Vulcan Materials, Kirkpatrick, Concrete Incorporated, and many other partners who are investing in this work to help improve these neighborhoods and to provide opportunities for the young people and the adults to have better access to education and better access to healthcare. And you can see that they also are working to improve nutrition through community gardens and mobile health markets and vegetable stands, and et cetera. Next slide, please. Not surprisingly in the world university rankings, UAB was ranked first in the US and seventh globally for community outreach around health and well-being. And as the largest employer and certainly the largest academic medical center and one of the finest in the country and our university broadly, we take our service to our community very importantly. We want to do all that we can to have UAB help our community be a place for excellent education and good quality of life and good access to health care. Next slide, please. It's been challenging, but also our teams in UAB Arts, Al Stevens Center Arts and Medicine, Ava, have been working hard to continue to bring the arts to our community, to our UAB community and to our community beyond, to our young people. And they have been innovative and they've used virtual events and socially distanced live events. You can see a photo there of the Al Stevens Center partner in the Birmingham Arts Drive-In. And you can see in the bottom that Ava is hosting their most ambitious exhibit ever called A La Carte, featuring works from over 30 international known artists that focus on food to explore social and cultural issues. So innovation continues in the arts as well as in the sciences, medicine, and education. Next slide, please. Our athletic teams are more competitive than ever. This past weekend with the win against Western Kentucky, our 
football team home winning streak is 21, the longest in Conference USA ever, and the third longest nationally behind Clemson and Notre Dame. Our women's cross country team excels, recently had four top finishes in a meet, and they brought home the team title. And our basketball season tips off in late November, and our new men's basketball head coach and alumnus, Andy Kennedy, will start his tenure as head coach of our basketball team. Randy Norton and the Lady Blazers will hopefully have a great season as well. And work continues on Protective Stadium, which is the BJCC new multifaceted stadium that will be home to the Blazers beginning in fall of 2021. Next slide, please. Our campus plan continues to unfold, transforming our campus into the one of the most technologically advanced, modern and attractive urban campuses in America. We will be opening our newest residence hall, Green Hall in the spring semester. It's a 31,000 square foot residence hall that will house over 730 students. It also has a new dining hall, which is needed to serve our growing enrollment. And it's a LEED certified sustainable building, which we are proud of. Next slide, please. We're excited that the School of Education was able to move into their newly renovated space in the education engineering complex. They now occupy the wing that was formerly occupied by the School of Business and it was renovated over the past nine months and our facilities team did a great job as usual. And they're now holding classes there this fall. Next slide, please. This is our new information technology building. It's called the Technology Innovation Center and under the leadership of Vice President Kurt Carver, our IT and research computing have reached levels of excellence never seen before. This will be a modern 21st century facility that will contain our IT programs as well as our research computer. Next slide, please. We continue to renovate the McCallum Research Building under the leadership of the School of Medicine, Dr. Tika Benvenisti, Dr. Vickers and others in partnership with our facilities team, which is led by Greg Parsons and their team have done a beautiful job of renovating this, the largest research building on campus in phases of taking two or three floors at a time because it's still being occupied. When it's done over the next few years, it will be like a brand new 21st century building. And I've seen the inside as well as the outside. And it's a beautiful functional building. Next slide. We're excited to begin the first phase of the science and engineering complex, which will be located where the former School of Education was. That School of Education building will be taken down in late 2020. And this new science building will begin. It'll take about two years to build it. It'll be the home of the Department of Biology and the Department of Physics, all of their research and teaching activities. And it will be the home of new teaching facilities for the Department of Chemistry and their many growing programs. Subsequent buildings will house engineering and other science departments. Next slide, please. We're excited and hope to begin soon on the renovation of the former Lyons-Harrison Research Building into the Altex Steisinger Genomic Medicine and Data Sciences Research Building. You can see the renderings of what the new building will look like and you can see that it will have an iconic appearance with the double helix there. And it'll be beautiful during the day and at night. It'll house our data sciences research as well as Precision Medicine Institute. And it will contain a new modern conference center. You can see on the right, that tall part of it with the park in front will be the new conference center 
have a new green, green space and park in front of it on 7th Avenue. Next slide, please. Well, as we contemplate this past year and our successes, we look to the future. And as always, we set goals higher and we want to achieve things that are very impactful. We want to continue to provide a world-class education for all of our students and to provide every opportunity for each one of them to be as successful as possible. We will continue our research to discover new knowledge and change the future and yield new treatments and cures and revolutionary technologies and solutions to real world problems. And we wanna to continue to help drive robust economic growth in Birmingham. We will continue to provide leading edge compassionate care to all the people of Alabama and beyond. And we will do our part and help conquer COVID-19. We will continue to engage in our community and our grand challenge, we wanna change the health of Alabamians across the state over the next decade. It will take a lot of work and a lot of partnership, but we're excited about the challenge. Health, education, arts, culture, we need to build productive partnerships that advance our campus and our community and our state. And with that, I will stop and be happy to open the floor for questions and we have others on our senior leadership team available as well. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Dr. Watts. I think if we were on campus, you would hear applause at this point. <laughs> <laughs> but so we'll virtually applaud you. <laughs> applaud thank you. you. Yeah, thank you. All right, so we're open for questions. Um, I'm Rosie O'Byrne. I'm gonna help moderate the questions that are coming in. Um, we've already had a few, so I'll just jump in, but you're welcome to submit questions. Either um, you can disclose your name or you can do this anonymously. Um, Steve W says, outstanding work, thank you. Um, their question is, what have we not been able to accomplish that's still on our immediate or longer term planning list? So I'll kick it to you, Dr. Watts. Well, you know, I, six months ago, I would have had a different answer, but today, I would say that we have accomplished much uh, on our goals and list of activities for this year in spite of COVID. And I think if you take COVID into account, we've probably accomplished more than we have ever accomplished in the history of this great university. And it's because of the work of our people, unselfishly. I have never been more proud of UAB and our people and our community and our impact on our community. And our leaders and faculty and staff have worked so closely together. We've tried to communicate and express and show and share the challenges that we face so that we can all help participate in finding solutions. So I think if we had not had to deal with COVID, we might've done more in some areas, but the interesting thing is that with COVID in our hospital, we have had the highest case mix index, which is the level of severity of illness ever. But we've also taken care of more patients than ever. And we brought our clinical enterprise back up to full speed and it's actually ahead of full speed of a year ago, which we thought was about as much as we could do. Being able to bring our students back to campus in this hybrid format in the fall has been a real important accomplishment. And in spite of COVID, we thought we might be down in enrollment, but we are up and I think it shows the excellence of the programs, but we also prepared as well as possible to make sure we had the safety measures in place on our campus through facial masking and through social distancing and through diligent hygiene and hand washing. And we've done well on those fronts. There have been a few times where some have let down their guard and we've had some increases in students over the last couple of weeks. And it just goes to show that we have to remain vigilant and we have to work with this virus in our 
nets. And we know the most powerful way to do that is to use these safety measures until we develop vaccines that will hopefully protect people in a much broader way. So it's a great question. And uh, I think fortunately we've been able to accomplish everything we set out to and probably more. The other thing I want to mention is that, you know, back in March, we were looking at the severity of the impact on our healthcare enterprise and our university. And we were facing unprecedented challenges of potential losses. So we had to implement strict cost cutting measures and at the same time work on campus where essential, but virtually for many others. And we were able to stabilize our budget and end the year on September 30th with a balanced budget and going into fiscal 2021 with our increase in clinical activity and with our research enterprise returning to full speed and with our academic enterprise being very active. We're gonna have a good year in 2021, but we still have challenges to overcome. Fortunately, our state budget is stable. It will be about 2% above last year. And that 2%, unfortunately, was taken up by expenses like new technology for our hybrid classrooms, et cetera. But we will have a positive bottom line. And I want to thank our leadership in our financial areas, Alan Bolton, Senior Vice President for Finance Administration, his entire team. I want to thank Don Bogarella, Chief Financial Officer of UAB Madison and the health system. And I wanna thank the leaders in the School of Medicine, the other schools who worked hard to implement these cost cutting procedures. We were pleased that even though we didn't have a merit pool for salary increases in the coming year, we were able to return the 403B match, the employer match and we allowed everyone who couldn't take vacation this year because they're working 24 seven to roll that over into the future because we want you to have that benefit. And we also work to be able to combine for more vacation days right before Christmas and New Year's as we did last year so that our employees can have increased time with their family and friends and recharge their batteries and we want them to be excited about coming back for 2021. To follow up on some of the things you just said, an attendee submitted a question uh, asking about merit increases. Are they still off the table? UAB has saved millions of dollars in the pandemic through furloughs, savings with employees working off campus, CARES funding, increased enrollment, increased research funding, and finally, by not matching our retirements for six months. If not, where are all of these savings going? So I might yeah, uh, I pass that, that over to, to Alan. Yeah, I'm okay. glad, to, sure. glad to take Dr. that Watson, one. Thank Alan. you. Uh, so I'm Alan Bolton. I'm the Senior Vice President for Finance and Administration. Great question, and, and thank you for that. Um, we are not, as Dr. Watch mentioned, uh, moving forward with the merit program for the current fiscal year that just began two weeks ago. Uh, and it is because of the financial impact of the pandemic. Um, your, your, uh, the questioner is correct in, in some of the savings that have been uh, reaped, but there's also been uh, significant investments in the campus to prepare the campus to uh, uh, resume operations during the pandemic. So things such as investment in classroom technologies, that have enabled the distance learning. There, those have been very significant as we partnered with the provost office and Dr. Carver's area and in information technology to get um, everything uh, equipped and ready for the hybrid classroom setting that we're in now. We are spending a lot of uh, resources on COVID testing across campus that, that will continue to keep us safe, not only this semester, but uh, through next semester as well. Lots of investment in cleaning supplies and protocols, uh, the face mask that Dr. Uh, Watch 
uh, Watts mentioned uh, were, were all provided to all students, faculty and staff as, as we resumed operation. So very significant cost. Um, and um, that's where the resources have been committed for the current year. Let me also say that if we had not done those things that you enumerated, we would have lost $50 million. We wouldn't have had a balance bottom line at 930. Mm -hmm. It was through all these cost saving measures, which affected all of us, that we were able to make up that $50 million. And going forward, we are anticipating a balanced budget, but there are many financial challenges that could present themselves to us. We did allow raises for those who were promoted or who achieved tender, uh, tenure in, in the faculty. And we did restore that retirement benefit when the new year started on 10-1. And again, that affected everyone. If we hadn't have done those things, we'd be like a lot of other universities wondering how we're gonna survive. The health system faced even greater challenges and uh, worked extremely hard to bring back the clinical enterprise as quickly as possible. People working day and night and through CARES funding and through those cuts, they were able to balance their budget a year in, which back in March, we would have been, if you'd asked, we'd say we weren't going to be able to do that we're gonna still have tremendous challenges. A lot of states, universities are, you know, down 20 or 30 or 40% in their support and they're struggling to survive. Because we have strong fiscal management and, you know, have great enterprise in all of our missions, we were able to withstand this and in a way that really um, many people would find exceptional. Thank you. Another attendee asks, um, with the changes being made to provide more hybrid and online courses due to the COVID-19 pandemic, will employees be allowed to, the opportunity to take four online classes without incurring additional taxes for, for the employee benefit? Currently, employees can take up to four in-person courses or three online courses without being taxed for the employee benefit. The price difference between these type of courses is the online fee. With no foreseeable end for the COVID-19 pandemic, employees want to limit their time and exposure to the virus as much as possible. Would it be possible to waive the online fees during this time for employees? So I'll give that to Alan Bolton. Sure, glad to answer that one or respond to that one. One of the real benefits of a town hall forum like this is we're often um, have issues raised that have not been brought to our attention before. This is this is a new one. We've we've had some texting while the question came up among those of us on the call. So we will certainly commit to discuss it among the provost office, my office, and HR. And uh, we'll be glad to, to circle back with everybody um, through our follow-up communication on this. But thank you for the question. It's a good one. Um, an attendee, uh, Dr. Benoit, I think I passed this over to you about um, students, uh, you and Dr. Jones. Uh, an attendee was curious about the recent email that went out to students addressing hanging out at residence and that there could be escalating sanctions imposed on students. Could you just give a little background to that communication? Oh, I actually think Dr. Jones should take this one. Okay, Dr. Sure. Jones. Certainly I can start and perhaps Dean Vicker may have some additional uh, comments as well. If you look over the last two weeks, the number of students that tested positive have increased significantly with last week being the highest number. Um, and looking at our public health experts, our medical providers, as well as contact tracing, what we're understanding is that it's not the behavior of our students on campus that's caused an increase, it's the behavior of students off campus that is causing an increase. So we're taking a more proactive approach to help our students understand what the implications are and try to mitigate the increase in cases. So that's why we have taken that approach. I'll, I'll comment, Rosie. I think we've met with our students, particularly of our medical leaders. And I think the 
the, the real tenor of that conversation was the concern about the increased number of positive students. But most of all, the positive message that we gave, hopefully, that how proud we were of the students and what they had accomplished. Uh, I think the whole campus should be extremely proud uh, of UAB's performance and protecting our staff and students really been recognized on a national level. Yet with that said, uh, there has been an uptick, which is significant for UAB. It doesn't reach the level of some other schools our size, but it's big for us. And so our efforts, as Dr. Jones said, highlighted that we found that on campus remains extremely well managed and arguably very safe as it relates to transmitting the virus. But activities off campus clearly appear to be the source of the increasing numbers that we've had. So that was why the focus to try to address that. Thank you. And just a follow up question there from an individual that says, what is the current plan to ease students back into in person instruction and on campus activities? So many, so many are struggling with anxiety and depression under the isolation of COVID restrictions. So I don't know if you want to continue. Um, but Dr. Benoit, and I'd like to start with that one. So right now, as Dr. Vickers just indicated, there's an uptick in cases. So our plan for the spring is to continue with the variety of different kinds of instructional methods that we had this term um, and to begin on January 19th. At the same time, we recognize that um, everyone has fatigue with the pandemic and we're trying to uh, work with students and faculty and staff to think about different ways to address mental health issues and give opportunities for safe ways to uh, socially engage with others. Um, I know that Dr. Jones's Student Affairs um, Organization has been working very intently both this semester and we're also doing planning for next semester for students to have different kinds of ways of, um, of addressing mental health issues. I don't know, Dr. Jones, would you like to contribute more to that? Oh, absolutely. So not only we're um, looking to hire more staff within the Council Center to help um, support our students as they um, face mental health challenges, but also um, during the temporary um, time period, we bring in um, um, temp employees, temp um, counselor um, providers as well. So we understand that our students are in significant need like all of us um, as we continue to face the, uh, this um, pandemic. Uh, but at the same time, we want the students to know that we put in everything, um, putting all our places, uh, our staff in places to best support them as well. Just to chime in, uh, in the class schedule, it indicates what format a given course is in. So if a student prefers in person, then they can go after and sign up sections for those courses that are in person or hybrid, which has partly in person, partly online. So that's why uh, registration was delayed so that a student would have all that information about the format in which a class is gonna be offered in the spring so they can choose uh, you know, if they want to stay off campus and online, then they choose X, Y, and Z. If they want to be in person, then A, B, and C. So that choice is there, unlike in spring where everybody went online. I also want to remind um, all of us that the stress of the pandemic also affects faculty and staff and the Employee Assistance and Counseling Center um, is available to address uh, any concerns or anxiety that you may be feeling because we know that this is something that is affecting our entire community. Thank you. I think uh, it's important for everyone to understand that we are doing and want to do everything possible to support our people, our faculty and staff and our students. And as both Pam and John mentioned, we are increasing those activities and if more is needed we will do whatever we need to to help meet the needs of our UAB community. Uh, staying kind of in the same conversation about mental health and uh, downtime, uh, an attendee has asked has there been any consideration to adding additional bonus days in between Christmas and New Year's given the inability to reward employees in other areas and the need of many staff to rest physically, mentally, and emotionally? Well, that's what we did with those two days. The day before New Year's Eve and the day before Christmas Eve. 
are added so that you can have what is equivalent to, I think, a four or five day weekend. Is that right, Alicia? I'm sorry. Yes, sir. It will um, make two four day weekends. So two additional days were added to recognize what was mentioned, and that is to reward our employees and to have them have more holiday time with their families. And attendee uh, says, Dr. Watts, thank you so much for the great wealth of information you provided today. What does the future look like as far as being able to come back to working full time on campus for those presently working from home? Well, it is hard to predict the future of this virus, but in all honesty, medically and uh, public health wise, this virus will be with us for many months and probably years. And the likelihood of having a vaccine will not be a reality until probably at the best, the first quarter of 2021, and it may be the latter part of that. But to deliver that vaccine to, you know, 300 million people is going to take time. So we have to plan for the spring semester as we are doing. And just like for the fall semester, we are trying to create opportunities where our students can choose the type of instruction that best fits their needs. But there will be in-class instruction and we will be pursuing our research in the research laboratories. Our investigators and their research teams have to keep six feet away from each other. And that's awkward, that's not easy but we have to do it so that we can protect our community. We know those three principles help protect from spread of the infection and it's worked well on our campus. And the reason we're concerned about those student gatherings is three or four weeks ago, we were having you know, 12, 15, 17 students a week being positive. And the last two weeks it's been about 50 or 60 students being positive. And it followed in part that homecoming weekend where there were gatherings off campus and other things that were not in the best practice of social distancing and mask wearing. But we can manage this infection. We have to, if we do what we know we need to. And it is likely it will be with us throughout the next year and probably beyond. There's no guarantee that the vaccine will work and that's unsettling for some, but it is just the truth. That's why there are multiple vaccine and some newer antibody trials. So there's diversity in the attacks that are being pursued because we don't know which one might work, but it's going to be with us. We'll be as normal as we can, but be, I'm thankful that we can work both on campus and remotely where necessary. And we can continue to pursue our mission. And I hope that we have, you know, record years in the coming year. I think we can, but we have a very dedicated UAB community and we want to do all we can to foster safety, but also to be as successful as possible in pursuing our goals because the people of Alabama and our families and everybody needs it and the people beyond. Several people have submitted the question about hiring freeze and if it would be lifted. So I'm not sure that oh. I'll be Alan. glad to take that one, Rosie. Um, yeah. So we did roll into the new year and have continued the hiring suspension. Uh, there is a, a uh, exception process uh, to that if, uh, if there are certain uh, conditions that could be met, such as ex external funding, for example. Um, and we can intend to continue that through at least the first quarter of this fiscal year. Uh, once we have good information on our financials at the end of this quarter, so probably in the January, Febru February timeframe, uh, we'll bring that back as well as the travel restriction back for reconsideration, but at least through the first quarter, we'll maintain the hiring suspension. 
I'm going to try to squeeze just a couple more questions in. Um, maybe uh, Dr. Vickers, this one could be for you. Has the university looked into the potential of new rapid testing technologies like the Abbott Finex COVID-19 credit card to integrate into campus surveillance in the spring semester? So we have, we've initially uh, looked into, and uh, again, the purchasing of the Sophia platform, which gives a, a 15 minute test turnaround time. Um, the, and, and that will be a part of our pathology. It is already a part of our student health department, um, but it will also be included in employee health. The challenge with both this platform and the Abbott by Next Now platform is availability. I think many of you have heard the government announcement of availability, but they bought up 150 million of those cartridges, so they're not accessible to the general public, unfortunately. Hopefully by the end of the year, in early January, we'll ha have more access to the Binex now, and hopefully the general public will as well. Um, but I would say the following is that um, you can be tested negative one day, and if you encounter or sort of forget the principles that we've talked about, you can be positive the next day. So testing is really valuable, uh, but it doesn't supersede the behaviors that Dr. Watts mentioned. But in short, we are pursuing the more rapid test as a part of our tools. Thank you. We have um, many questions that came in that we just can't get to. So please know that we will share our communications team uh, researches the answers for these questions. And we provide answers um, to unanswered questions in e-reporter. So please look out for that. Um, having said that, I'd like to just kind of um, hand over to Dr. Watts for some closing remarks. And Thank you, Rosie. Yep. Well, we're glad to have this session today to update you on where we are and where we're going. And we want you to be as well informed as possible. We want to work together to find solutions to the challenges that we face. But let me face, but let me just say this. I couldn't be more proud. Our institution couldn't be more proud of how our faculty and staff, leadership, our students have performed under these unprecedented times. And while there are challenges that continue to face us, and while we don't have an excess of finances, we do have a balanced budget and we do have a strong institution which has withstood this tidal wave. And I will say this, we are in a better place than the majority of our peers around the country. And that's in large part thanks to all the great work that you all have done and the dedication. So let's keep on keeping on and let's continue to set our goals higher Let's do all we can to help one another be successful. Let's give our students every opportunity to be successful. And I think we have a very bright future in spite of this pandemic that we have to continue to endure, but can live with if we undertake the right behaviors. So thanks to all of you and thanks to all of our leadership for participating and helping answer these questions. And the ones we didn't get to, as we have in the town halls, we will find the answers and we'll post them where that you can go and find the answers. So thanks so much and have a great day. Thank you. Go Blazers. <laughs>